<clears throat> okay, um, today uh, we're here with novelist uh, Lynn Lurie. Um, her most recent book, Museum of Stones, uh, just came out last year. And uh, we also have an audio recording, which is, uh, is subsequently going to be coming up, we hope, soon on audible.com. And I asked Lynn uh, to talk about a writer that influenced her. And she picked Virginia Woolf, which was a perfect, perfect choice for our class. And Lynn, I'm, thank you for being here. And I'd love to hear why you chose Virginia Woolf as the writer that influenced you. Thanks, Dr. Brady. It's, a, it's really a, a pleasure to reread a story um, that I've loved and had not read in a long time. And when I read this, I found out so many more answers to your questions. I thought I had it easy. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on Virginia Woolf and then I'll give a little bit of background about me and um, what I think is so important in her work, which I have adopted, not even knowingly. You know, I, I, I feel like we read things 15 years ago and then they show up in the page as being an influence. And I really find that when I went back to this story. So um, I, I'm gonna talk about Virginia Woolf before I talk about me, because I think she's a hard, she's much more important. Anyway, <laughs> when, when Dr. Brady asked me, I was, let me, let me go first, because I, I wanna grab the, my favorite person. And, and you know, Virginia Woolf would be without a doubt the person. Um, and so let's just give you a teeny bit of background on her to put her in historical context. Um, she was part of the Bloomsbury group, which, um, and her life spanned the course of the First World War and the Second World War in Europe. She was living in Britain, obviously in London. Um, the Bloomsbury group was loosely a group of novelists, critics, painters, poets, economists, and um, they, were, they were the intellectuals of the time, although most of them were very much from the aristocracy. Um, so they were pushing boundaries against Victorian England, but they were also from Victorian England. Um, what I think, the short fiction of Virginia Woolf, I realized looking again at it, is a great place to start because every word she uses is glorious and every sentence is glorious compounded. And so to read her as a, as a, a full novel, you just miss so much. So I think this story is a great way to fall in love with what I fell in love with, which is that she is a person who who pays attention to every single word, how the word before and how the word after plays into what she's trying to do. Nothing exists alone. And then the words, when they start adding up, they roll into sentences, which are equally as gorgeous and beautiful and important. So I, I hope that was something that I was able to apply to my work, which is attention to, to the word and the sentence and the, how, they, how they work off each other. They are their own sort of dynamic living fake creature that you get to work with. Um, this story was written towards the end of World War I, which was 1917, I believe it ended. Um, as I said, her life spanned World War I and World War II. And basically, I think the effect that that had on so many artists at the time, um, you know, it was the dawn of the 20th century, but it was the century of these two world wars. And um, it became clear to people that death and horror and um, the acrimonious state of the human condition was a threat to not only life, but to obliterating art and the ability to produce art. Um, I think that she never writes specifically about war, but the war is everywhere. And I think that's another piece of what I loved so much about her, which is that I don't think it makes a lot of sense most of the time, I just want to see how I wrote this, to, to document something, you know, that, but, but to, 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 to fold it into the story. Um, and 
so, so she doesn't tell us anything about the war. She doesn't talk about casualties. She doesn't talk about, um, you know, the after effects, the fear, what happened to London, none of it, but it's in every single word that she chooses. Um, and I think that's the best way to tell a story or that's the way I like to tell a story. Um, the other thing that I think she does, which I am always enamored of, and I think I've tried to emulate, which is how do you say the least amount and, and be able to convey mountains, which I guess is what the poet does, which Dr. Brady knows better. Virginia Woolf wasn't a poet though, was she? Well, not if, yeah, not, not if you think of it conventionally, but just rereading the mark on the wall, those kinds of amazing leaps and the, the fabric of it to me is characteristic of your work and characteristic of poetry, which, you know, if you think of poetry as, as being a, uh, an expression of the human impulse to, to, towards stillness and toward dissolving of identity, then Virginia Woolf is a poet. And as you pointed out, sometimes with her novels, they're so poetic yes. that it's hard to yeah. adjust to, yeah. to, to all of that. Whereas a short story, you read it, as I was reading it again today and thinking, boy, this, you know, this doesn't have line breaks, but we've kind of abandoned line breaks anyway, a lot of times. And, right. and this distinction between poetry and fiction is, is part of, I think, what she's challenging, part of what you challenge too. And I think that's another reason why she's so important because she she basically challenges convention convention, and she is using this hybrid form. This short story reads to me a little bit like an essay, a little bit like a short story, like I, we were just saying, like poetry. And I think that she's basically saying, let's not pay attention to the rules. We know what the rules are but sometimes they don't give us the latitude to express what we need to express. And I feel like my writing too is a hybrid. It, 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 it's not easy to classify. Um, so I think she probably gave me the freedom to, to say, I'm going to write something and I don't know what it is right yet. Is this a novella? Is this a poem? You know, and she also in later on, you know, she abandons things like um, chapters, which is something that I've also tried. Um, but I also think that her, her use of silence and, 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 um, you know, I'm a big believer in the, in the, in saying something and then leaving a gap so everybody can, can focus and do with it what they might see, um, which may be different than the person sitting next to you. And to me, that's what art does and what art is. Um, let me see what else about her that I love so much. Um, I think she's she tends to be very fractured in her insights and her pieces, but they all do connect up. Um, I think most of thinking in the world is fractured and we connect them up in our own individual ways. And how the artist does that and is understood is what makes the artist special. Um, so what I was going to say most about her is that she said somewhere in her life, she said, books continue each other, meaning, you know, that they are separate, but they all fit together. And, and I feel like that about my work as well. You know, they are three separate pieces of, of fiction, but um, they are so connected because we are all connected. Um, so those are the things I think that have influenced me about her work. There was just one other thing. Oh, yes, okay. So before we get into the story, um, the other thing I was, I thought when I was reading this and I was thinking it's an essay, I was thinking Virginia Woolf is giving us a book on self-help here because she is basically telling us, not that she knew this, she's telling us how to be creative. You know, people always say, you know, how do you, how do you create, how do you make somebody creative? And in a weird, strange way, she's saying, She's telling us how to do it in steps, you know, that you, you look at something and you, you let your mind wander. You think about what it might mean to you. You connect it to different words. You connect it to different phrases, to visual images, whatever it is. And you just keep going with it 
And generally, I think that's how we all create, which is not so conscious of it. And, you know, so when you sit down and you're forcing yourself to write, it, it sometimes doesn't work. You just have to sort of look at something like a mark on the wall that might mean something deeper and better and interest, more interesting to you and get you started. Um, I also think she works off of things that aren't seen. You know, this is clearly about something that is seen, but she also lots of times works off of um, emotion. And I think that the emotional tenor of the work is so vivid and, and, and um, important. Um, in this story, I ended up feeling like there are very many parallels also to what's going on in the world right now. Um, she doesn't talk about it, but after World War I, the British realized that the men that they had sent off to war, and it was just men in those days, were not physically fit. They were not healthy. And after World War I, they, the, the British system implemented this health system that, that provides for everybody. Um, and, and basically, we are seeing these sort of, the inequality in the world, which Virginia Woolf and the Bloomsbury Group saw, and they knew how this was dangerous, the, the vast inequality in the world, and the inequality of the men who went to war in World War I and the men who stayed home. Um, and I think we're seeing it today as well. You know, what, what, what has happened with this virus is there are certain zip codes that are more affected than other zip codes. The inequality of, of, of the life that we are living is so much more pronounced. Some people can escape the cities. Some people have more space. Some people, you know, aren't living in a family of 15 in a small place. And I think that 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 is the that is our threat you know that is our world war threat and i think she already sort of saw that and um in a in a strange way i just think when we read well i know when we read we're looking for parallels with today and ways to survive today and that's what i took from it today um that it, it's it's very it's significant the inequality in the world is what is divisive but if you want to talk about the book now, why don't we do that? Unless you have a question to me. Well, I, I, what I love is hearing about that, the, the, the notion of this silence that, and I think of John Cage saying, uh, what we require is silence, but what the silence requires is that we go on talking. And this, this notion that every, you know, you're right there at the border between what can be said and what can't be said, or what it has to be intuited or somehow Right. made in a circumference as Emily Dickens says my business is circumference and that notion that is so clear in in Wolf and I think that there is an opposing um, impulse that it's very interesting I, 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 I recall Wolf was not very fond of uh, Ulysses you know, <laughs> didn't, didn't like it at all because it, that's that's the opposite impulse it's profusion you know, if you if you destroy Dublin, uh, to if you burn Dublin to the ground, says Joyce, uh, you could rebuild it using Ulysses as a blueprint. So there's no silences in Ulysses. He fills up every little crack. Whereas here's Virginia Woolf deploying consciousness diffused into the world that doesn't really have a voice. And you can see how that also plays to the notion of the equality of those people that are not seen and, uh, and the things that are, that are misseen. I, you know, when I was thinking of that mark on the wall, she keeps coming back to it. It's like a radical distortion of scale, you know, this tiny thing and then all these, these other huge things. So, and that might be the reason I, I consider, I consider it poetically as opposed to, to thinking of it, as you say, telling a story that begins at the beginning and tells you everything that happened. And, right, and which she's not very good at, especially, yeah. well, certainly not here. It doesn't almost feel like there is a story. Um, right. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's more, so it starts off with her literally sitting, you know, I think she's having a glass of wine uh, or a cigarette and she sees something on the wall and, you know, you might think, okay, so this is going to be about that mark on the wall. Um, and then the story unfolds or the essay unfolds and it does come back to the mark on the wall, but 
it doesn't matter really what that mark on the wall is. Although I think maybe there is some significance in it being a snail, which we will get to in a minute. <laughs> but um, so even in the very beginning, um, what I found interesting, as I said to you, that she, how she doesn't document the war, but how the war seeps in to everything. So there's a couple of passages that, that it just, it's just glaring, even though she doesn't use war at all. So in the, it's probably in the second paragraph, um, she said, um, art should have ideas behind it when we are torn asunder, also poetry. But I'm sure she's talking about torn asunder, meaning the fabric of, of, of life as we know it and war. Um, and then later on, she is talking in the next paragraph um, how, okay, so it's the end of the third paragraph, I believe, and she goes, she's talking about everything that's lost. Um, and again, she's listing things that have nothing to do with war, but we think it must be related to the war. Um, and then there's a beautiful line, which is tumbling ahead, tumbling head over heels in the asphalt meadows like brown paper parcels pitched down a chute in the post office with one's hair flying back like the tail of a racehorse. You see, yes, that seems to express the rapidity of life, the perpetual waste and repair, and so casual all haphazard. Well, asphoids are lilies, which we talk about at funerals, I think. And um, she's talking about in the next thing, the dust on the mantelpiece, which is again, we know um, that everything ends in dust. Um, and the waste, the waste in the rush. And um, she talks a lot about the waste in the rush, in the rush, which is why I'm thinking the snail maybe is significant because what is a snail, but something that goes very, very slowly through life. You can barely, it's imperceptible how it moves. Um, and the part I just read to you, she's describing how fast life goes. And she says, like being blown through the tube in London, you know, like, the, so you think of the, the subway rush or the, the masses of people rushing to the next thing, missing what they've seen on the way um, and all of the waste and all of the loss in that. Um, so I feel like, again, we're, we're back to so many different things here. The, the letter, the, the word asphalt, it, you know, it means something. It's not, it just, it's not that it just sounds beautiful right there, but it is to make you think of funerals. It is to make you think of death. And then if you haven't done it the first time, then the next line, she's talking about the dust on the mantelpiece. And this brings me to a question of my work, which is my first book is called Corner of the Dead. And of course I had no idea, but I'm gonna just read you the first sentence. Um, uh, there are places in the Andes where we are afraid of dust. And the book is based, the, the book is about um, political violence in Peru. And it is about uh, people who have been disappeared. And it is about one person that is disappeared. And at the end, his bones are found. And the, you know, it sort of leads back to the dust in the first sentence. Um, she also talks about bones in the dirt here. You know, she's talking really mostly about a walk and she's in, or the, the gardens, but she always goes back to something that, is much deeper and, and in, in the sense, I think it is the war again and the waste and the loss. Um, and also how, how fleeting it is that we're here on earth and how fast it goes by and be a snail maybe, like pay attention. Um, do, do you have any questions or thoughts, Phil? Before, well, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Brady? <laughs> no, um, we, we've known each other a long time. We can, uh, we can use first name. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, um, but uh, <clears throat> no, I was thinking of the snail too. The, you know, the state of the housekeeping. Yes. 
you know, the fact that this, there's this, you know, this is dust all over here. She doesn't even want to, the, the sense of lethargy, I mean, the sense, I'm not going to get up and look at this. You know, it's like, yeah. because, because I'm not, any action, it's almost like any action that she takes prohibits or inhibits all the other possibilities and, right. and, 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 and leads us to a narrative that she's not willing to commit to. Right. So it's, it's, so it's, uh, it's really amazing about that. And once again, I, I find that to be a characteristic of poetry. Okay. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, what else is so... Um, oh, she, the, the part where she talks about... Hang on here. The freedom. When she defines freedom... Uh, oh, okay. So here's another thing I was thinking. So towards the end, well, she keeps bringing up this almanac, the Whitaker's almanac. And she's also talking about reflections and mirrors and gleams of light. Well, the almanac, you know, I looked it up. The Whitaker's almanac is like an almanac which has in it data, facts, information. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's sort of using that as the antithesis of what she wants us to do, which is see the, the reverberations and the beauty and the illusions in things. Um, and so when she's talking about, um, um, okay, um, You can edit this part. Can you edit this part? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know how to do that. Oh, okay. So thank you. <laughs> Let me hurry up. It'll okay. be, it, it'll, it's the real thing. Yes. Okay. So I can't find the part where she talks about freedom. Ah, uh, okay. So it's it's a paragraph that's it's a long paragraph because all of her long and it says and then i came into the room as the paragraph but very towards the end of it she talks about what freedom illegitimate freedom is if it exists and i think it has to do with going away from convention it has to do with going away from the almanac going away from facts and allowing your mind to wander so if we read what comes before it, um, she says, um, okay, she says, suppose the looking glass smashes, the image disappears, mm. and the romantic figure with the green of forest depths all about there is no longer but only that shell of a person which is seen by other people. What an airless, shallow, bald, prominent world it becomes, a world not to be lived in. So it's what Dr. Brady just said, you know, she doesn't want to get up to deal with the dust because she's going to miss the beauty in the room and the beauty of all these connections. She says, as we face each other in omnibuses and underground railways, we are looking into the mirror, the, that account for the vagueness, the gleam of glassiness in our eyes. And the Nautilus in future will realize more and more the importance of these reflections. For of course, there is not one reflection, but an almost infinite number. Those are the depths they will explore. So though, those the phantoms they will pursue leaving the descriptions of reality more and more out of their stories. So she's basically saying, I live in this concrete world, you know, we are coming out of this war, there is destruction, there's, there's all of this reality is around us. We have the Whitaker Almanac cataloging and chronology, you know, keeping a chronology of everything that's happened last year but this isn't what's gonna save us. This isn't what is going to give us art, give us beauty, give us a path forward. Um, and then she says, um, and then she ends up calling it illegitimate freedom, 
this ability to go beyond the 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 reality into an abstract and she does that also in the same long paragraph um uh let me just see sunday walks country houses tablecloths were not entirely rear, real were indeed half phantoms and the damnation which visited the disbeliever in them was only a sense of illegitimate freedom what now takes the place of those things i wonder those real standard things and she says hell and so forth leaving us all with an intoxicating sense of the Ill illegitimate freedom if freedom exists she says basically the whitaker's table of precedency um the since the war half a phantom to men and women who soon one may hope we will be laughed into the dustbin where the phantoms go um, so she's telling us to go beyond that, and that's how we find an illegitimate freedom. I just thought that was a really interesting description of freedom. And Phil, you wrote about phantoms, and can you talk about that in a, in a literary sense, and maybe the way in which she's using it here? I took it to mean, you know, illusions and the non-reality. Does it mean anything to you differently here to you? I think, you no, know, the way you're describing it, for me, I, the, my last book was Phantom Signs. And what I mean by that is, is the, uh, the notion that writing itself is an act of unreality. It, it, it's compressing three dimensions into two. And it's, it's something that is, of course, meant to represent yet a whole nother activity, which is talking. Right. You know, which is three dimensional again and, and diffuse and, and ephemeral. So there's a strange uh, kind of disconnection among the, the person who speaks and then who writes and then who is writing in order to find this reflection of themselves speaking. Right. And that transformative thing, which is what I think, I think that's what you're, you're you know, you're getting yeah. at here is that you know, reality is going to become merely the beginning. The beginning. And yeah. novelists of the future are going to challenge, as she's challenging, the notion that there's a single way of looking at the world and mm -hmm. a, a masculine way of looking at the world, too. I was just trying to talk to, yeah, okay. I mean, that is definitely, a, will tell me, say what, say what you were going to say. But I just think that's part of it, too is that you know the, she talks about the men of the future and what what she hopes right. you know they will they will lose which is the singularity which we've always associated with masculine dominance and war I and think, war especially um and she does in the part where i was reading she specifically goes into talking about men but i, I didn't really want to talk about the division in you know it, it her the, that because i'm not sure i really buy it um that that a feminist doesn't deal with facts either. I mean, it may be a different way of thinking that women have, but I don't think that that's true. I think anybody can find this illegitimate freedom she mm -hmm. is talking about. Um, and she goes on in the same vein, I think, again, about the reality. And she says, nothing is proved, nothing is known. And again, that goes against the almanac and it goes against, if you want to call it the masculine view, you know, which is mm -hmm. X equals Y, you know, there's no variations, there's no gradations. Um, so she's, she is asking us to, as we sit in our homes and we're quarantined, to not feel bored because there's a million <laughs> things that are going on in the world that are extraordinarily real that we're all trying to contend with. And if you're sitting in your room, you may not see it, but if you look at the bug on the floor, you <laughs> might actually understand something that is 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 so illuminating. Um, and I think I think that's important, especially for us right now, because we have been asked to slow down. We aren't rushing through the tube. Um, go slowly through your life, um, because it's the spiritual part that's important. Yeah, the coffee's important in the morning to get you up, 
but what's the spiritual part of that coffee? You know, is it the smell? Is it the memories of your childhood? Is it, you know, the sound of a percolator if you're older and you heard your mother percolating the coffee in the morning? You know, there's so much more to the, the, the finite. And I, I swear, I think this is a plea to see beyond that. And, and people always say, you know, and she is full of despair. Virginia Woolf is full of despair but she's also full of hope and she's and like I said this is a self-help book it's not just a self-help book on how to be creative it's a self-help book on how to find and and look for hope and 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 I think she does that all the time even though we certainly know about her mental illness and her suicide and and her her desperate you know on being ill is probably one of her favorite as my favorite essays of her which talks about the pain of, of mental illness. And I don't think anybody's ever done it that way. Um, so, but she always has hope. And I think that's what you have to walk away with right now um, from this book. Even though she says there's no good in buying newspapers at the end. <laughs> and how could you not agree with that? Um, curse this war. This is her last time. God damn this war. All the same, I don't see why we could have, we should have a snail on our wall. And the mark on the wall, it was a snail. And that's how it ends, you know? Curse the news, curse reality, go for the snail, slow, the, slow down. Yes, yes. And of course, I think how, uh, when she's talking about not reifying herself, not, not making herself into something that's absurd and ridiculous, the ending of that story is so surprising because it goes against what we think of uh, as the gothic, you know, of course we don't know the idea. So many writers would have not told us what the mark on the wall is, let it be a mystery, but right. she brings it right back to the domestic. Yeah. She brings it back. Right. Oh, it was a snail. Yes. Uh, this whole, and the story just dissolves into, into that rather than turning something into like an Edgar Allan Poe, you know? Right. <laughs> right. And I think that's probably <clears throat> a characteristic of, of her work in general. She hasn't, uncanny ability to describe the quote the 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 housekeeping and turns it into an entire like a mythology you know it's 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 a world of its own um and she probably does that better than anybody i've ever read um which probably is why people say she's a feminist, but I don't know what that means anymore <laughs> um uh, whatever so I hope everybody, even if it was hard to read, because it is hard to read, there's so much there. Um, if there was just one part that you liked or some sequence of words or uh, you know, a few sentences or any description, just focus on that. Like you don't have to digest the whole, pa the whole thing because I think the best way to look at this is as it is a poem. And the thing about a poem is it is so dense and it is so abstract and it is so complete and it is so beautiful, it is so perfect. But if you try to tackle the whole thing, you may be deterred to keep going. So, so find the one or two things that, 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 that you liked and, and, and read that over again and maybe even memorize it and think about it as you go through the day and you look at the snail on your wall. And thank you, Virginia Woolf. I mean, thank you, literature. This is what is keeping us alive right now. Um, and hopefully some of you will be future writers and you will refer back to this when you're looking for some guidance on how to be creative. <laughs> thank you so much, Lynn oh, Lurie. Thank you, a pleasure. Virginia Woolf. Thank you. Okay.